Welcome back to the Gallant Goblin. I'm Grady, substituting for Theo, who's battling Grix in the wine cellar. Today we are looking at Monster Menagerie 2, the sixth set in the WizKids Icons of the Realms line of pre-painted miniatures for D&D 5th edition. It came out in January 2017. We bought most of these off the aftermarket, so some may be a tad more bent than normal, and we are unable to provide rarity distributions for a brick or case. As usual, we will show every painted sculpt, but we will only include invisibles if we have them, invisibles being clear plastic duplicates of an existing painted sculpt. Let's get to it. Ah, the giant rat. That classic monster trope for D&D and MMOs. Giant rats have a bite attack and pack tactics, though if you want an actual Swarm of Rats mini, you're covered by either the Pathfinder Battles Skull and Shackles, or the Icons of the Realms Waterdeep Dragon Heist sets, or the Deep Cuts Unpainted line. There's a giant rat variant whose bite inflicts disease. Both types of giant rats have a challenge rating of 1 8th. They can be summoned by the Conjure Fae and Conjure Animals spells. They are a possible form for were-rats. As you might expect, they appear in many adventures and random encounters tables. Kobolds are generally lawful evil reptilians who worship evil dragons. They tend to be cowardly and self-serving, but they live in tribes and have close ties within their communities. They'd rather be left alone and do not usually set out to cause mayhem or harm on their own. They are more dangerous when cornered, and in fact may live harmoniously with other races, for example building sewer systems for human towns, as long as they are appreciated and left to their own devices. The standard kobold from the Monster Manual has a challenge rating of 1 8th, though Volo's Guide to Monsters added additional types and made them a playable race. They appear in Horde of the Dragon Queen, Rise of Tiamat, Tomb of Annihilation, and Tales from the Yawning Portal, as well as various encounters tables. They're also found in Eberron. Goblins are a very insecure race, dominated by many more powerful creatures. They therefore try to assert their own agency by enslaving, abusing, or bullying anything weaker than themselves. They follow a strict caste system that prevents most of them from ever imagining a role outside servant or served. They're typically encountered wielding a scimitar and a short bow, and the standard goblin has a challenge rating of one quarter. They appear in basically every adventure. They were made a playable race in Volo's Guide to Monsters. The Halfling Rogue is the first of the NPC or player character minis in this set. Most Icons of the Realm sets have these, minis representing playable and typically good aligned races, with a playable class that can be used for characters your party meets, or as the avatar for one of your player's characters. Halflings are generally friendly and enjoy traveling and meeting new people, though some may spend their entire lives in a rural village. With a bonus to dexterity, they make good rogues, though this mini is interesting in that she doesn't appear to be wielding weapons or doing anything particularly roguelike, though she may be holding a stone for a sling in her hand. Both halfling and rogue are core options in D&D. Bullywugs are humanoid frogs. They're amphibious and have their own language, which allows them to communicate to actual frogs and toads. They're typically found in swamps and camouflage well there. The basic version of a Bullywug attacks twice with a bite and a spear and has a challenge rating of one quarter in the monster manual. They can potentially come in a few colors and you could probably use Grung, a tree frog like humanoid race, and Bullywug minis interchangeably, with the main difference being their sizes. Grungs are small and Bullywugs are medium. Bullywugs appear in Ghosts of Saltmarsh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and Horde of the Dragon Queen. The Drow Elite Warrior is a martial character. Its stat block has it wielding a short sword with which it can parry melee attacks. This mini has something that looks more like a staff though, and could be used as a spellcaster instead. Drow, also known as Dark Elves, are evil elves who live in the Underdark and worship the spider goddess Lulth, surfacing only to raid and pillage. Drow Elite Warriors are trained to defend their houses, typically against other creatures that may live underground. They have a challenge rating of 5 and are in the Monster Manual. They appear in Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Storm King's Thunder, and Out of the Abyss. Orcs are a religious tribal race engaged in perpetual warfare to please their gods. There are stats for many types of orc enemies, though most wield great axes and spears or javelins rather than the warhammer or sword depicted on these minis. The Red Fang of Shargas from Volo's Guide to Monsters wields a scimitar. 
Many orcs are aggressive and have extra movement when approaching enemies. The standard orc has a challenge rating of one half in the basic rules. Orcs appear in Lost Minds of Phandelver as well as potentially any other adventure. They became a playable race in Volo's Guide to Monsters. Ghasts are ghouls who have been imbued with extra power by Orcus, a demon who created ghouls from an elf who worshipped him. They are more intelligent and may lead other ghouls. They have a stench that can poison those who breathe it in, and though ghasts and ghouls are undead, they have resistance against being turned, possibly because they serve a powerful demon. Ghasts have a challenge rating of 2 and are in the basic rules. They appear in Curse of Strahd, Princes of the Apocalypse, Tomb of Annihilation, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and Ghosts of Saltmarsh, as well as Xanathar's Guides, Random Swamp, and Urban Encounters tables. At first glance, this human cleric appears unusually well-armored and combative for his class, making this mini suitable for a fighter as well, but clerics in fact start with scale or chainmail and a hefty weapon such as a mace or warhammer. Some clerics may even specialize in the war domain, available in the player's handbook. Often finding themselves in dangerous situations, a cleric must be able to fight to defend others. Monks are masters of unarmed combat. Though they can wield weapons, they are one of the few classes that provides default options to fight without. Their key points, representing their ability to harness the internal energy of their bodies, allows them to perform multiple attacks per turn. Humans are well suited as monks, since monks can take advantage of multiple ability scores or the extra feat available to the variant human. For players wanting to optimize their combat builds, an elf fighter would want to choose dexterity as their primary ability score rather than strength, meaning they would need to wield finesse martial weapons or ranged weapons. This is due to the elven racial bonus to dexterity. Of course, for players who do not wish to min-max, choosing any race and class combination that appeals to you or works well for a story is an equally valid choice depending on the group you're playing with. This mini has a nice paint job with a shiny paint that gives the armor a metallic effect. Bugbears are the strongest of the goblinoids, but arguably only slightly more disciplined and intelligent than goblins. They have a reputation as aggressive beasts, though in reality they are quite lazy and do not attack indiscriminately, though they are plenty vicious and violent when they want to be. Due to their strength, they deal extra damage with melee weapons and typically wield a Morningstar and Javelin. The standard bugbear has a challenge rating of 1 and is found in the basic rules. Like goblins and orcs, they are a very common enemy that shows up in most adventures. They were made playable in Volo's Guide to Monsters. Sahuagin live in the deepest parts of the oceans, but terrorize all parts of it, and even raid coastal settlements, earning them the nickname of Sea Devils, though they can only stay out of water for up to four hours before suffocating. They are mortal enemies of the aquatic elves, and though the war between the two races wreaks havoc, it prevents the Sahuagin from establishing total dominance of the oceans. Sahuagins worship a shark god, and can telepathically command sharks. Standard Sahuagans have a challenge rating of one half and are in the basic rules. They appear in Ghosts of Saltmarsh, Tales from the Yawning Portal, and Xanathar's Guide's Underwater Encounters table. Hobgoblins are the most intelligent of the goblinoids. What they lack in strength compared to bugbears, they more than make up in military training and discipline. Their entire lives revolve around their tribe, called a legion, in which they train to conquer others. They are strategic, preferring to scout and weaken enemies before engaging, except when they encounter elves, whom they hate with a passion. A standard hobgoblin is equipped with longsword and longbow, but using other weapons like shields or dual-wielding swords, as depicted in these minis, is well within their capacity. They have martial advantage, allowing them to deal extra damage to targets if an ally is in melee range of the enemy. Regular hobgoblins have a challenge rating of one half and are in the basic rules. They appear in Lost Mine of Phandelver, Princes of the Apocalypse, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and Storm King's Thunder. Half-orcs are well suited as barbarians mechanically and lore-wise. Orcs are prone to bouts of great rage, and half-orcs, typically born from alliances between orcs and humans, experience many of the same emotional outbursts. They deal extra critical damage and are able to endure what would be knockout blows for other races. This all corresponds well with the barbarian's rage mechanic, which can often cause them to take significant damage as they wade into the fray. The first gnolls were hyenas, who ate the victims of the demon lord Yenogu. Gnolls are vicious and pure evil, ravaging settlements wherever they go. Wizkid seems fond of making variant gnolls wielding flails, even though it's mainly the Flind, the leader of a warband, that wields flails. Having gnolls that wield spears or longbows, as is the case for most gnoll stat blocks, would be preferable. 
A regular null has a challenge rating of one half and is in the basic rules. They appear in Out of the Abyss and Princes of the Apocalypse. This is a pretty neat human wizard figure, outfitted as a traveler and wielding a spell effect. Since the ears are covered, this figure could also be used for an elf or half-elf. As far as player characters go, this one is a bit more rugged looking than a lot of spellcaster minis. And as usual, humans make pretty good wizards due to their well-rounded ability scores or the bonus feat they can start out with. Many icons of the realm sets contain one type of hag, so you can slowly collect all the types. Sea hags are the ugliest of all, living in polluted waters. They hate anything beautiful, wanting to destroy or twist anything or anyone beautiful they encounter. They have a glare that can knock out frightened enemies, and can use an illusory appearance spell to change forms, though they are cursed to look ugly even then. They have a challenge rating of 2 and are found in the basic rules, though the monster manual provides stats for when they are part of a coven of 3 or more, raising their challenge rating to 4 and giving them additional spells up to 6th level. They appear in Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Tales from the Yawning Portal, Princes of the Apocalypse, Ghosts of Saltmarsh, and Xanathar's Guides Underwater Encounters Table. They can be summoned by Conjure Fey and Conjure Woodland Being spells. Wormlings are the youngest and smallest of the four life stages of a dragon, representing them from when they hatch until they become a young dragon. As a metallic dragon, brass dragons are usually good, and they are the most outgoing, enjoying conversation to the point they will kidnap travelers to talk to them, using their sleep breath attack to do so. They can also breathe fire. Brass dragon wormlings have a challenge rating of 1 and are in the basic rules. An ancient brass dragon appears in Rise of Tiamat, and brass dragons are in Xanathar's Guide's Desert Encounters table. White dragons are the smallest and dumbest of the chromatic dragons, which are typically evil aligned. White dragons are basically beasts and are found in cold areas in the north or atop frigid mountains. They have a cold breath attack in addition to their bite. White dragon wormlings have a challenge rating of 2 and are in the basic rules. Like older dragons, all wormlings also have lairs, which can attack intruders and increase the wormlings overall challenge. White dragon wormlings appear in Storm King's Thunder and Tales from the Yawning Portal. One nice thing about white dragons is you can also use most unpainted dragon minis as one. Black puddings are corrosive oozes who damage any non-magical weapons or armor they touch. Weapons and armor lose effectiveness with each contact until they melt entirely. Black puddings attack with pseudopods, can squeeze through narrow spaces, and climb up walls and onto ceilings with no trouble. Larger oozes may split into two smaller ones if hit by a slicing attack. Like many ooze minis, this one is designed to be able to hold a medium or smaller figure inside it to represent a creature being attacked or consumed by the ooze. Black puddings have a challenge rating of 4 and are in the basic rules. They appear in Out of the Abyss, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Princes of the Apocalypse, Storm King's Thunder, Tales from the Yawning Portal, and Curse of Strahd. Golems are inanimate constructs with an elemental bound inside to serve a purpose defined by the golem's creator. Clay golems are often created by priests, but because clay is a relatively weak material, the elementals may gain some freedom if the clay golem is damaged, causing the golem to go berserk and attack anything nearby. Clay golems are also healed by acid attacks. All golems are immune to being transformed. Clay golems have a challenge rating of 9 and are found in the basic rules. They appear in Tales from the Yawning Portal, Rise of Tiamat, Tomb of Annihilation, Curse of Strahd, and Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Hippogriffs have the lower half of a horse, the upper half and wings of a giant eagle, and a head that has elements of both creatures. If you're youngish like me, you mainly know them from Harry Potter. They can be trained as flying mounts and are often preyed upon by dragons, griffins, and wyverns. They attack twice with beak and claws. A hippogriff has a challenge rating of 1 and is found in the basic rules. They appear in Storm King's Thunder, Princes of the Apocalypse, Dragon Heist, and Xanathar's Guide's Hill Encounters Table. Iron Golems are the strongest type of golem. They can take any form, but typically resemble suits of armor. They make two melee attacks each round and have a poison cone breath attack. They are healed by fire, immune to poison and psychic attacks, and can only be damaged physically by magic weapons or weapons made of adamantine. They have a challenge rating of 16 and are in the basic rules. They appear in Storm King's Thunder, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Ghosts of Saltmarsh, Lost Laboratory of Quailish, and Curse of Strahd. Planetar angels are lawful good celestials. 
They are the weapons of gods and have innate spells, such as the ability to raise the dead, control weather, or summon an insect plague. They have a healing touch, divine awareness that tells them if someone is lying, and true sight, which reveals all manner of things, including invisible objects. They have a challenge rating of 16 and are in the basic rules. They appear in Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Stone golems may be carved to resemble humanoids or beasts and are often found posing as statues, guarding places such as tombs or lost cities. They have the ability to slow other creatures as though making them feel the length of time that the stone itself has endured. Like iron golems, they can only be damaged by magical or adamantine weapons. They attack by slamming targets repeatedly in melee range. They have a challenge rating of 10 and are in the basic rules. They appear in Tales from the Yawning Portal, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Princes of the Apocalypse, and Curse of Strahd. Wargs are evil monsters resembling twisted direwolves. They may be raised by goblins or hobgoblins and used as mounts, but they are fairly intelligent and can speak their own language as well as others. If hungry or mistreated, they will eat their rider. They have a challenge rating of one half and are found in the basic rules. They appear in Storm King's Thunder, Princes of the Apocalypse, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and the Hill Encounters Table in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Galeb Dur are fairly intelligent earth elementals who can be summoned from the plane of earth and bound to the material plane by a powerful spellcaster to guard a location. They can animate nearby boulders or else ball up and roll into enemies, knocking them down. They may stand motionless, fooling others into thinking they are a boulder. Galeb Dur have a challenge rating of 6 and are from the Monster Manual. They appear in Out of the Abyss, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Lost Laboratory of Quailish, and Xanathar's Guides, Mountain and Hill Encounters Tables. Joy of Joys! The Uthgart Barbarian is an ultra-rare figure with a variant. Typically, if you buy a case of 32 boosters, you're guaranteed one of each painted mini, but that is not true for this set. You will likely only get one of the two variants of the Uthgart Barbarian. Uthgards are tribes of wild humans in the north, descended from Uthgar Gardolfsson, a near-mythical chief from the distant past. They are raiders, the D&D equivalent of Vikings, though some may be willing to trade with civilization. The Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide introduced the option to be an Uthgard as a character background. Uthgard barbarian enemies use various stat blocks, such as those of tribal warriors with a challenge rating of 1 8th, or berserkers with a challenge rating of 2. They mainly appear in Storm King's Thunder and Princes of the Apocalypse. The Mind Flayer is the other ultra rare variant figure in this set, along with the Uthgard barbarian. Also known as Illithids, Mind Flayers are an iconic D&D villain race like Beholders. They are telepaths who once had a dominant, world-spanning empire, but these days are mainly found in the Underdark. They eat the brains of sentient creatures, absorbing their memories, and they are able to mentally subjugate and enslave them as well. They can perform an attack to extract the brain of any creature they have grappled, instantly killing them. They tend to live in hives controlled by a central elder brain. Mind Flayers have a challenge rating of 7 and are in the Monster Manual. They appear in Dungeon of the Mad Mage and Dragon Heist. Tieflings are the descendants of humans who struck a pact with the Devil Asmodeus, forever changing their appearance to reflect an infernal heritage with a tail and horns. They are viewed with suspicion due to that long ago association with fiends, even though present day tieflings may not be evil at all, though warlocks are also people who have struck a bargain with a powerful, typically evil entity in return for magical powers. Xanathar's Guide to Everything added the option for warlocks to serve a good aligned patron. The base tiefling gains bonuses to charisma, which is also the primary spellcasting score for warlocks. Gricks are tentacle monsters that hide amongst rocks to ambush and eat anything that approaches. Because they leave behind the belongings of those they consume, Gricks must periodically move once travelers notice the signs of their presence. They may also congregate to a larger alpha Grick to hunt in packs. The Grick's tentacles reveal a beak with which it can also attack. Gricks have a challenge rating of 2 and are in the basic rules. They appear in Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Lost Mine of Phandelver, Curse of Strahd, Out of the Abyss, Dragon Heist, Tales from the Yawning Portal, and Xanathar's Forest and Underdark Encounters Tables. The Half Gold Dragon Sorcerer could be used as a Dragonborn Mini, but Half Dragons are actually something different. They may be the offspring of a polymorphed dragon who reproduced with another species, or a transformed creature due to a spell or ritual involving dragon's blood. 
their lifespan doubles relative to their original species, and they acquire traits from the dragon side, like a half-gold dragon being shy and secretive. They gain dark vision, short-range blind sight, damage resistance based on its color, fire for a half-gold dragon, the ability to speak draconic, and the dragon's breath attack, with its power being tied to the creature's size. This medium-sized mini would have an attack equivalent to a gold dragon wormling, which coincidentally, we're coming to next. Gold dragon wormlings are like the other wormlings described so far, with a lair and unique breath attacks. Gold dragons have a fire breath attack and a weakening breath attack that debilitates the target's strength. Gold dragons are the strongest metallic dragon, wise and reserved. They are dedicated in fighting against evil. Gold dragon wormlings have a challenge rating of 3 and are in the basic rules. An adult gold dragon appears in Dragon Heist, and gold dragons are also in Xanathar's Guides, Forest and Grasslands Encounters tables. Red dragons are the greediest and vainest of dragons. They also have a temper and can be extremely vicious, making them the type of evil dragon most commonly depicted in folklore. They have a fire breath attack. A red dragon wormling has a challenge rating of 4 and is found in the basic rules. Red dragon wormlings appear in Curse of Strahd and Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and may also be encountered in mountains and hills. A red dragon is in Rise of Tiamat. A dragon is born a wormling and grows into a young dragon. Black dragons are the most evil dragons, valuing only strength and torturing the weak. They may often have kobolds, serving them in their lairs. They live in swamps and the ruins of ancient kingdoms and are amphibious. They have an acid breath attack. A young black dragon has a challenge rating of 7 and is found in the basic rules. A black dragon appears in Rise of Tiamat. True to their nature, this mini seems particularly hard to keep on its peg, torturing anyone who doesn't just super glue the whole thing together. Gynosphinxes look like winged lions with the head of a female humanoid. They are typically found protecting treasures, often divine, and challenge adventurers with riddles. They are legendary creatures, meaning they can take extra actions when it is not their turn in a round, and are ninth level spellcasters with immunity to divination and other mind reading effects. In their lair, they can shift time, changing the order of combat, aging or de-aging enemies, transporting foes forward or backwards 10 years, and teleporting everyone to a different plane of existence. Gynosphinxes have a challenge rating of 11 and are in the basic rules. They appear in Tales from the Yawning Portal and Lost Laboratory of Quailish, and may be encountered in deserts. Beholders, like Mind Flayers, are iconic monsters in D&D. They are a floating monster with a giant eye and a gaping mouth full of teeth, as well as eye stalks that can shoot ten different types of rays at foes. Their main eye can project an anti-magic cone, though that affects its own eye stalks. They are highly paranoid and xenophobic, but have powerful minds and their dreams can warp and shape reality, giving birth to other beholders and all manner of strange creatures. They also come in different colors, though beholders in the same geographical region tend to look similar. Beholders have a challenge rating of 13 and are in the Monster Manual. They appear in Tomb of Annihilation, Out of the Abyss, Dragon Heist, Tales from the Yawning Portal, and Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Androsphinxes are the counterparts of Gynosphinxes, but with the head of a male humanoid and are 12th level spellcasters. Instead of riddles, they prefer sending adventurers on quests and may reward them with a hero's feast. They can roar three times a day, with the first roar frightening creatures, the second deafening and paralyzing them, and the third dealing thunder damage and knocking enemies prone. They have a challenge rating of 17 and are found in the basic rules. They may be encountered in deserts and may be part of the ranks of the Azorius Guild in Ravnica. Monster Menagerie 2 is a set that has not aged well. It does have some highly desired creatures like dragons, wormlings, sphinxes, and golems. This is also currently your only Icons of the Realms option for certain creatures like the Sahuagin, Grick, Planetar Angel, Hippogriff, and Ghast. But the paint jobs on these are not impressive. They're a bit plainer like Monster Menagerie 1 with less texturing, but it feels not as precise here. A lot of the poses also look a little weird to me and you can see a lot of seams in the sculpts. There's definitely some standouts, like the half-gold dragon sorcerer, but even the ones that are fine, like the beholder, there are better options out there now. The Rage of Demons beholder is bigger, the dragon heist Xanathar is a similar color scheme but has the rings so it could be used as Xanathar or a regular beholder, and Nolzer's Unpainted is where you can get a beholder for cheaper. 
And that seems to be the recurring theme for this set, for the common and uncommon rarity minis. These are very core creatures that, while good at the time, now show up in a lot of other sets. There are the unique rarer minis, but unless you buy a brick of eight or a case of 32 boxes, you're not going to get very many of those. You get about three rares for every eight boxes. There's also the unfortunate situation with those ultra rare variants, where most icons of the realm sets, if you buy a case of 32 boxes, you are virtually guaranteed to get at least one of every type of mini. But here, you are not going to get every painted sculpt. You are going to be missing those rare variants. As for the invisibles, like Monster Menagerie 1, you do seem to get a decent chunk of them, more than in the more recent releases. Uh, but And many of these are actually for creatures that can turn invisible, so that's always nice. Uh, but let's be honest, you're probably not buying these sets for the invisibles. So really the only situation where we would recommend buying booster boxes of Monster Menagerie 2 is if you're a brand new collector and you just want to hit the ground running and get a lot of these very common monsters very quickly. Otherwise, if you're planning to collect a lot of sets, you're going to be swimming in kobolds and goblins and gnolls and bugbears very quickly. So in those situations, you're better off going to the aftermarket and just buying singles of the specific minis that you want or even looking at Pathfinder Battles or other pre-painted miniature lines for similar sculpts. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please click the subscribe button to stay tuned for more content of this sort. Uh, you can also check our video description below for links to our social media. And we always love hearing from you, so please feel free to leave a comment sharing your thoughts on Monster Menagerie 2 or uh, any suggestions you have for future videos. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time at the Gallant Goblin.